January 10th, 2023 to order. Um, let's go around and introduce ourselves. Uh, Joan Kent Mayor. I'm Susie Nalu Barry, Marsha Martin, City Council. Tim Water, City Council. John Creighton, LDBA Board. Karen Rodriguez, City Council. Shakita. Here, Darren Peter, Rose City Council. Kimberly McKee, Longwood Development Authority. Joe Farrell, Longwood South South Development Authority. Harold Dominguez, City Manager. Uh, Chris McGilbrey, LDBA. Wes Parker with the LDBA. Tom Cruz, City Council. Right. Can we invite back here to introduce themselves? Uh, David Warren Parker, the city manager's office. Great. Jenny Marks, city manager's office. We're going to check the petition for the manager. Genetic staff, public works. Okay. Dallas. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We have two more. Yeah. <laughs> I had an egg roll in my mouth. The Dallas <laughs> Styles also. Uh, with the city. E.B. <laughs> Mason, the attorney. Jim Goldman, yeah. chief financial yeah. officer. Yeah. Appreciate that. Carol Rutherford, the CAB board member. We're good. I don't think we need to do that. Yeah. Go ahead. Everybody's introduced it. I'm John Salise, I'm a hospital video. Paul Kevin Hart, thank you. And Sandy Cedar, Jessica Drew, Assistant City Attorney. Uh, yeah. Is that a promotion or demotion? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Paul and Al, the city manager. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Eugene. Right. <laughs> Our topics to be discussed is pedestrian access and safety in the downtown area. And I'm going to turn it over to Chris McGilbert. Awesome. Cool. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pez. Thank you, City Council. Um, you know, uh, obviously, there's a lot on your plate. There's a lot of priorities that we're discussing here as a city. So we really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation about something urgent and really important to not just our downtown. This is a citywide issue, but um, you all appointed us to serve in this capacity and on the LDBA board and represent uh, the LDBA. So we'll be discussing this, uh, one of our six pillars within our master plan of our downtown, which is uh, cognitivity and access. And I just wanna start this conversation by reading um, the cognitivity vision um, that we all adopted back in 2017, it's been five years already. Uh, access to our downtown is easy, safe, and low stress. Easy, safe, and low stress for people living, working, or visiting by any form of transportation, understanding that almost every person is a pedestrian at some point in their trip to downtown. We're all pedestrians at some point. And most of you know, I, I work at Front Range Community College. I, I teach there and we're going through this massive change right now where, where we're completely changing our structure, moving from campus space. Right now we have three campuses, one in Larimer, one in Westminster, and one in uh, Boulder. And we're moving to a one college model with a new president, we're under new leadership. And so there's a lot of very, very important decisions being made across the college. And one of the things that, um, we're, that I'm always reminding myself of as we're going through this massive change is, how is this impacting the student? And how is the student experience through this change? Is it improving? Uh, and if it's not, that's, that's a really big problem. And so I think we all want to keep that in mind as we have this conversation is, you know, we've experienced adding 500 uh, new units to our downtown because housing was a, a top priority for us coming out of our master plan in 2017. And we've added a lot. We've done a lot of great things and we uh, experienced a lot of significant growth. Um, and we also have over a thousand units in the pipeline. So we're gonna be adding a lot more houses and residents. And so one thing, you know, as we're experiencing this growth, a big concern is pedestrian and the impact it has had on the safety of our pedestrian. Um, I don't know if you've had the opportunity of walking through our downtown as of recent, and try to cross the downtown at any point and what that experience feels like. Um, and so keep that in mind as we have this conversation. And so um, the goal today, we wanna, we wanna discuss safety. You know, and right now in our vision, it's easy, safe, and low stress. And as a board, we feel that it's, it's not very easy right now. 
It's not very safe. Um, and it's definitely quite stressful um, throughout the day. Uh, and so we want to discuss our overall philosophy, uh, transportation philosophy as a city and how that is, uh, how that relates to the, the downtown. What are our clear priorities moving forward? Uh, and how do these, how do the projects that we're currently working on in the LDBA align with the city's priorities? Discuss ways that we can, um, ways that we can make real change happen now. Um, we have a lot of different plans. We've got, you know, Longmont 2.0, Envision Longmont, the master plan. And so um, what are some real meaningful steps that we can take quickly to address the safety of our community and then dis discuss funds and next steps? Um, and so we have a residential advisory board that we created that actually brought up this issue, but we hear, we hear concerns every single day. Kimberly, the board, we hear concerns about the safety of our, our pedestrians every single day. And sometimes it takes, unfortunately, um, something very tragic to bring this to light. Um, and someone really um, dear to our hearts um, passed away. Uh, recently due to uh, traffic um, and so uh, because of that it prompted uh, you know it's always been a priority you know in our LDBA master plan and because of but that really is what brought it to it intensified the, the discussion um, you know we have a unique area that's meant to be pedestrian friendly bringing our community together is at the heart of our town and, um, and it's really meant to put people first um, people above colors and um, creating spaces for residents and visitors to, to walk, to explore, to feel comfortable, to feel invited. Um, and the traffic is just too fast. And, um, and it's uh, poorly timed crosswalks. Uh, there's several broken and incomplete sidewalks that are deterrents to the overall success that we've worked so much on over the last five plus years. And as we continue to grow and improve our downtown, taking meaningful steps on these issues is um, at critical importance. Um, you know, we're going, through, we're, we're gonna go through uh, some of the issues. Um, Kimberly's gonna walk us through some of our current projects um, and that we'd like to have a deeper discussion around the overarching high level philosophy of transportation and safety with you all. And, can't thank you enough for the collaboration and partnership um, and again taking the time to, to have this conversation uh, with us and uh, Kimberly I'm going to hand the baton over to you. Um, just real quickly I think uh, Chris touched on the pillars of our master plan um, to remind folks um, they are economic vitality, placemaking and urban design, our creative district, connectivity and access, land use and leadership. We're here today to talk about connectivity although everything is important where we work together, um, of creating an environment where people can live, work, and play downtown. Um, you can see number five, those are the six overarching principles of all the work that we're looking at. And number five is improving and expanding the infrastructure that ensures downtown is well connected and easily accessible by multiple transportation modes. And like Chris hammered home, really looking at it through that lens of easy, safe, and low stress as we're walking around. Um, and again, I just want to reiterate that that we are our partners in all of this in this community and we can't be more thankful for the investments that city council has made in downtown and we are just here to um, continue to make it safe and comfortable for all of our uh, residents and visitors um, i quickly want to go through the goals and strategies under each of those pillars are particular goals and strategies that were created by the community by a working group for connectivity that was um, wide uh, reaching of folks from the entire community back in 2017. Um, the first one is to align those transportation and land use planning efforts um, to achieve a well-connected downtown. When we look at this, the con connections to the Greenway are absolutely essential to our success as we want to get rid of single vehicle occupancy and having everyone have to drive here. The Greenway is a gem. It is a fantastic asset. One of the things that we talk about all the time but it's not super easily connected to downtown. If you wanted to come off, you know, around Main Street, there's not a safe, protective way to get there. So looking at the continuation of our street grid, um, as well as easy ways to get from the Greenway and developing easy and effective walking and biking connections from the Greenway and from other parts of downtown. Um, 
I bike all the time, but I would say I'm a B minus level, C level biker, right? And if I get out of my neighborhood and really have to go around, it's not low stress or comfortable. Um, so how do we get people here easier? Well, we look at enhancing downtown as a central hub of citywide transportation. We all know that, you know, first in Maine, you are all actively working on that, and that is going to be fantastic. But there are many missing linkages around that to get into downtown and to walk around. If there aren't sidewalks or it doesn't look comfortable, we do not want that first and main transit center to be a car hub where we're having a call park where people are driving there, jumping on, and then driving instead of walking around. So finishing those things, I think, are essential. Um, encouraging alternate use of transportation modes. And one of the things that we talk a lot about, I talk with Phil all the time, Phil's like on my bat phone, but talking about transportation demand management. and. We all know that there will be a construction project here across the street and that we have a lot of concerns around parking. How do we dig deep and say, what are some of these transportation demand management things that we can experiment during this time and really start to gather information and say, what are, what are residents or visitors willing to do? Would they do a shuttle? Would they park further if we gave them downtown dollars and incentivize them to do so and walk? What are these things? So I don't have the answers today, but think that that's definitely an opportunity for us to explore. Um, as we look at enhanced bicycle and comfort, um, certainly our bike infrastructure remains very important as to what we're doing. We did have a, a, a dismount zone. Um, I think that uh, people chose to dismount for a while but are no longer choosing to dismount and are now just really flying up and down. So looking at further enforcement of that dismount zone, um, better connections to neighborhoods, and then ensuring an adequate, well-distributed uh, parking supply. Evaluating regularly, we do have a parking study that will wrap up in January and we'll be able to give you the results of what does that true parking snapshot look like today. Um, and preparing for future needs. I talk with Carol all the time when we're talking about what are some of these hot spots where people are gonna be living and playing that are new to downtown and how do we strategically invest in some parking that can, um, can be used in multiple different ways. You know, that's what we did with the scope on top said we know that there's people that are working at the county that are coming but then at night they're leaving and all that parking is, is available so we have that widely open to the public so how do we really get the most bang out of our budget for parking um, but the number one thing that we have that we really want to focus on today is maintaining a safe and enjoyable walking environment for pedestrians of all ages and abilities and I think that's really important to remember as we have an aging community it's going to get even um, we're gonna walk a little slower. I know that I walk a little slower than maybe I did in my 20s. Um, and so that that's gonna be pretty important to focus on. So when you look at the goals that we have there, it's things like improving, um, improving pedestrian connectivity, ensuring sidewalks are ADA accessible, um, expand the alleyscape project, ensure that mid-block crossings allow for high visibility, support and encourage building site design that enhances safety, working with CDOT and the city to have automobile compliance with the scope posted speed limits. So those are some of the things that um, are in our, our, our jointly adopted master plan. So this is some results of a survey that we, that we got um, about 2020, 2021 is when we got these. This isn't the whole survey, I really just pulled out the questions about what we're talking about today. But we asked what prevents you from visiting downtown? Inadequate parking is something that we have heard probably historically since the first car hit downtown. Um, but traffic issues is something that we have not heard since recently. And that matched the um, matched what people were saying about parking. So it was very interesting that it is really starting to come to the forefront. These that you see beneath are things that people typed in. So I copied and pasted exactly what they typed in, but these were just a smattering. Tons of excessive speed, lots and lots and lots of stuff around speed. Traffic safety, safety and noise are deterrents to visiting and spending time downtown. The highway makes walking and biking difficult, detractable in character. Traffic signals and crossings are not sufficient to keep people safe. Short street crossings for pedestrians. We hear that over and over and over. Um, Vehicles are driving too fast and they're too loud, and that um, Main Street is very busy making walking scary. This is just a smattering of the things, but that was the really what we were hearing over and over and over within that survey. The survey was administered through CU Boulder, 
Um, and so that's how we got these results. <clears throat> We did ask what people like most about downtown. They like community feel, the local businesses, dinings, and, and the um, history and the vibe. Suggestions to improve better and more quiet connectivity, parking, and access. That was the overwhelming. More shopping and dining, and then increased gathering space and cleaning it up a bit. And then what do you dislike most about long, about downtown? Again, was connectivity, traffic, parking, bug access, and pedestrian issues. Not enough choice, and then um, the need for more um, social services. So that's what we're hearing as we're asking people about what they think of downtown. In our 2019 parking study, one of the interesting things that they had said was they saw a bunch of people that would drive from one side of Main Street to the other. And they, some of them are, were working the system trying not to get a ticket, but they said many of them weren't even in a timed lot, right? So they were just driving during the day from the east side of Main to the west side. And they said um, in all of their time of doing this, they haven't seen anything that was that high or incredible of people driving from one side to the other. That's a pretty clear sign maybe that people don't want to cross the street. Um, it said that traffic was observed to move quickly and some pedestrian crossings were difficult to navigate in the allotted time. And this was from the people that were collecting the data who collect data in towns all over, right? So this was kind of their observations. Um, they said there was difficulty crossing the highway and they noticed that if you did not start your walk the minute you got the um, clear walk sign, that you probably wouldn't make it across without. And when you talk about low stress, it's always, you know, you take three steps in and then you get the red countdown, you know, that's not, that's kind of stressful. Um, so that was just, I wanted to pull that out because that was right from the report of their observations as they were collecting the data. Um, on paper, I think our downtown looks amazing. We have the mid-block crossings, we have fallbacks, we have all of these things for traffic calming. It doesn't feel like the traffic has understood that this is for them to go slower or to calm. And so I just think um, we've done great work in this, in, in this realm, but we're just not seeing the traffic calming that we were hoping to see. Um, some of the things that we have done um, as a result of our master plan is better lighting. We changed out the lighting in all of our public parking lots and we added the string lights on Main Street. We did hear people saying that it was too dark and maybe they were worried about parking in one area and walking to another. Um, the board took that very seriously and upgraded all of that lighting. We did initiate the dismount zone. I'm sure some of you that have been on council for a long time know that that, that has been something that people have wanted. We changed to two-way bikes in the alleyways um, but we're still not seeing the compliance we would love to see for the dismount zone. Um, we have made investments in parking, the Spilcom Coffin Garage, like I talked about before. And um, we did, we worked with you all, and you were all fantastic to do the um, Bigger Hearts, Stronger Streets, where during COVID we went down to the one lane Main Street. And um, these are a few pictures that we captured. And what I love about these pictures is, man, those are full of the streets and people walking around the streets. And that's the, downtown that makes me happy when I see that of all of the people that are using our public space that are gathering and some of the things that um, I knew blew me away uh, when we did it that I wasn't expecting was it did feel easy safe and stress-free not what I was thinking about at the time I was thinking oh my gosh let's save the businesses and let's get people down here to do something but it was so much quieter um, I don't have the data, but I believe I was asking Phil, because I think Tyler was the keeper of the data, but it slowed the traffic down, but I think to like 24 or 24 miles an hour, and the speed limit's 25. Mm -hmm. And so knowing what that felt like to have people going the speed limit consistently and always was much more comfortable. Um, and so those are the kind of experiments that I think were very helpful into what we're trying to achieve. We've also added a lot of infrastructure for bikes, a lot of different bike racks and things like that. Um, and so, um, and we've commissioned a wayfinding plan that I'll talk about in a second. So. so here are some projects that are in the works because I don't want the great work that everyone's doing to go unrecognized. Um, right now we are, um, we had budgeted I think back in 2019 to do some preliminary alley planning. Um, it got kind of kicked down the, the road for a while because of a number of issues, but 
uh, we'll be kicking that off this year. It's really looking at that 200 block alleys and the 600 block alleys, but especially the 200 block alleys as we're trying to connect with South Main Station and then down into STEAM. Mm -hmm. Having that as a, a pedestrian corridor <laughs> is super important and probably not one that's super walkable today. Um, the wayfinding that we did with the city, I think a lot of our parking is maybe hidden. There's maybe some confusion as to is this public parking, can I park here, how long can I park here? Um, as well as just how do you get around and what is that kind of curated experience? So that plan is done and our board has um, allocated over $400,000 to implement that within the downtown area and we'll start to see that in 2023. We will be starting with all of the parking ID signs and the parking trailblazer signs to be able to get the community to know where parking is. Um, we're working with the city on a camera project um, to be installed in the alleys to soon help kind of elevate safety. Our colleagues in Fort Collins said that was a complete game changer for their alleys when they did that, that it really um, deterred a lot of the um, negative activities they were seeing. We talked about our parking study that will be coming out in January and we can share those results with you. Um, we have been working with uh, traffic engineering on mid-block crossing lights and having head lights. Um, if you remember, uh, we had a tragic accident on the 500 block in 2021 um, and it had that mid-block crossing pole. And so we have said, hey, let's not just replace it with a pole, let's see if we can replace it with one with the flashing lights. And so CDOT has been amenable to that. So this summer we're going to do that and hopefully we'll also be doing that at the 300 and 400 blocks because I feel very strongly that it has to be consistent. So you know, okay, I'm looking for this and this is where I'm gonna stop. So that's a great progress. Um, the lights alone maybe aren't, aren't just the answer, but it's a great step forward. Um, that's like the flashing lights. Yeah. And uh, the hope is that they're going to help us. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't know if that was exactly like that. I would. I mean, just the yeah. general idea. So, yeah, yeah, yes, exactly that. Yeah. Um, third Avenue improvements, which I can't speak to, but I know that those are coming this year. Um, the first and main project, like I talked before, we know that there's a parking garage coming there. There's going to be great bus transit there, but those connections are essential, making sure that we don't just build it without thinking of how is it going to connect to everywhere else. Um, quiet zones, certainly wanted to have some questions around the quiet zones, the timing, when would that be happening? When would that be happening in downtown? What would that look like? Um, so uh, Vision Zero, we have been listening in on your conversations around Vision Zero and think that that's very consistent things that we're looking at. We know that a transportation plan is coming. Um, Kaufman Street is something that we've been talking about. Possibly I might have heard grumblings about changing the timing of some of the signals, but I'm not sure if I missed anything else on this list. So as we go into our discussion, we can come back to this. I know there's some questions. I know that there's things that we'd really like to put on the forefront of as we're moving forward. And if I missed anything, I apologize, but I tried to scour through all of the CIP and budget documents to get a good reflection of what's happening. I forgot to mention Emory Street okay. is also a planned connection to the Green Road through downtown, but to the on, on the east side of Main Street. So that might be a little outside the LDBA, but I think it's on your border and it does connect down. So those are those connections that we were talking about. Is it is it just in a plan like in theory we want it, or is it in a plan like it's, it's in coming? our enhanced multi-use corridor plan? Same plan as uh, Crawford Street. So I forgot to mention that to you. So it would happen when Kaufman's connected or just sometime in the future? It's, it happens with development. Uh, okay, so. so if development comes in, we'll make the connection of Emory Street down to Boston Avenue. When you're talking about changing light signals, is that the timing that you've been talking about or is it just the thing? Well, it's, um, so right now I think it's an adaptive signal system. So there's cameras that are looking to say there's this many cars love to see changes in the timing, but I don't know if we can oh. talk about that. Um, so the next slide, um, you know, we commissioned the wayfinding and you can kind of see um, a little glimpse of what that will look like. We do have a test sign right in front of the scope on Kaufman if you kind of want to see. It's not, it's kind of a um, poor man's version of what we're going to do, but we wanted to get it up to kind of show that that's public parking and um, it'll be better when it's done for real. Um, but you know, one of the things that we also commissioned was a placemaking um, 
a placemaking plan and you know these kind of artistic crosswalks are happening all around the country and they did certainly say this might be a good way to kind of show number one that you're in a creative district number two really say there's pedestrians and there's pedestrians all over this place and so when i'm driving here it's going to feel different because it's meant and built to be a pedestrian district and i know um you know that's what downtowns are about that you're not in a car that is very walkable um and so how do we work together maybe to um, implement some bold pedestrian statements like this to say you know longmont is a place that we encourage you to walk and, and how do we make sure that it's not only a problem but it's clear and understandable what is the driver you're supposed to do in those situations because again we want to make sure that it's safe for everyone so um so there was a uh, CIP that was adopted in the 2023 budget um, for the Main Street Corridor Plan. The LDDA board has committed $250,000 in 2023 and put, um, and put it on for 2024 as well. In that CIP, this is all from the very community-driven plan of the Main Street Corridor Plan of, how, of things that could help um, in this area. Improvements of the alleys was on there. Um, median installation in the 200 block of Maine. If you've noticed, we worked together to raise the median that was in the 100 block between two headquarters and South Main Station. So that's raised up the same way as the medians are raised in the 304 and 500 block. Um, the DDA has budget. We this um, year we'll be planting that to make sure that it's a beautiful gateway. But then when you go to the 200 block, it's kind of like a real fast autobahn. It opens mm -hmm. way up again. There's no median. There's no nothing. And then you next back down into the historic core. So, you know, putting that median on is, is in that CIP, looking at the mid-block crossings and improvements in the downtown character area, um, which includes also maybe looking at adding a mid-block crossing on the 200 block of Main Street, adding those flashing lights, um, finishing the sidewalk connections and fixing those that are in disrepair, super important, and then speed mitigation. And, you know, in that CIP, it talks about what is going to a one lane look like in Main Street in that core? How do we slow, slow um, traffic? But what we want to make sure is the $500,000 that we've put in the CIP that we're working together with things that, that will be implemented, that are in agreement with the philosophy that we have here for transportation in our communities. We, we are here as partners. We have money on the table to help tackle some of these issues. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Chris for a conclusion, and then we can start the discussion. So, Council, do you have any questions at this point? Marsha. <laughs> this is actually for the staff um, because um, I'm on the um, Senior Advisory Board. And um, I've been there for five years because I love them so. <laughs> and every single year, it used to always be Tyler. It was, you know, it was, I think, Jim and Caroline. Caroline, then you, and then you own Caroline. I think she's lovely. But every year, we are promised that the crossing times on Maine, the block lights, will get longer every year. And I believe that somebody's trying to keep those promises. But what I think there must be is a quality assurance problem. You make a parameter adjustment in the, you know, there's this program, right, that, that uh, calculates, you know, the adaptive light controls and stuff. And what I think is happening is that the adaptive software must be putting it right back where it was before. Because all those old folks say it's just the same. I measure it with my phone and it's just the same. So my question is, after you make those adjustments, you guys send people out there to measure and make sure that it really is longer after you make the adjustment? Because I'm, I mean, people swear up and down that there's no change. And Susie, it's, you're saying, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like, I know, it's, it's, not, yeah. it's not the advisor at seniors only, but I, I think you're trying and it isn't happening. So I just wanted to get that out there. Appreciate those remarks, Marcia. So just to summarize what Kimberly just presented, people don't feel safe in the downtown. Um, and we have budgeted funds over 500,000 over the next two years. And so we wanna make sure that these funds 
are targeted, intentional, and providing the right value for us. Um, and we, uh, with all the growth that we're going to be experiencing, I mentioned we have 1,000 units in the pipeline. And so, um, what does our future look like? What does that plan look like to support that growth? Um, and then, what are some meaningful short term tactics that we could deploy um, that could really make a difference? So we're balancing short-term impact versus the long-term uh, plan. So what I've noticed, uh, I'm glad you're gonna be putting in your blinking lights for the walkers, but what I've noticed is that it's very difficult to see if someone's gonna be crossing because there's a car there. Mm -hmm. And um, from the sidewalk to the end of the car, how far does that person have to come out so that the driver can see them? So. I think that makes it very unsafe for pedestrians. Uh, the other thing I've noticed is sometimes the trees are hanging down and you can't see the signs. So um, those are very short term, immediate things that we could do, I think. Um, I've also had complaints, and I, forgive me, I don't know where the bus stops are there, but that during snows like this, the, the, who's going to clean those bus stops? That's, that's an argument that people don't want to walk and take the bus because they cannot get to their stop. There's too much snow. And that comes from, I think, the uh, snow plows. You know, when they plow, where does that snow go? It goes right up on the, on the sidewalk or in the uh, shelter. So, uh, especially with Kaufman Street, you're right across from the Rose, uh, Roosevelt Park. Mm -hmm. That's a walkable place for downtown getting off the hop or so we have to make sure that who's responsible for that um our TV says no I know that street people are too busy to get plowing the streets so I think we need to support <coughs> that and make sure that those places are accessible um so those are just the things I've noticed yeah that's good thanks for that insight um, John, Wes, Joe, fellow board members, do you want to give? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, well, really, I mean, that, you know, that first question is sort of what's on my mind is from a, a starting point is are we, what is our priority? Is it, is it moving automobiles through the community as quickly as we can, or is it creating a pedestrian? Um, environment in downtown and the answer to that question from my perspective drives a lot of other answers and unless we're explicit about it and we are all in agreement on it then implicit decisions about that drive a lot of decisions and so I think really what, what we need to hear from you and, and understand from you all is philosophically which is, what is the priority? Is it moving automobiles through town or is it um, making us a pedestrian friendly area that does feel easy, safe, and, and stress-free? I also think it's a critical time right now when you have an increase in density with housing mm -hmm. in the downtown. I think this is a really good time to make those changes. Mm -hmm. For me, it's uh, calling on <laughs> airports and buses. <laughs> Thank you, I, I think the, the simple answer in, in certain ways is that the more driving averse or car averse as far as moving traffic through town, the more pedestrian friendly you're going to get. And I think anecdotally you saw that when we had the one lane and it really did bring the speed down and it brought a lot more kind of safe sense of walkability uh, to the downtown, right? And then when we opened it back up, it went back to, you know, a, a very thick stream of traffic. Right, and so the more comments I see from people saying, I don't like driving downtown, uh, is going, well, the more people that don't drive down, downtown, the more pedestrian friendly it is. And to, to expand on that, if I go to downtown Denver, I don't like driving in downtown Denver so much that I will park somewhere just to get out of my car and walk to wherever I'm mm -hmm. going, right? Like at that point, I'm like, I'm not even worried about parking within 50 feet of the door I'm trying to go to. I just wanna get out of my car because this is really stressful to drive my car. Um, and so, you know, I think that first question is really the crux of it, the transportation philosophy. Do we really want to make downtown that traffic? Uh, 
averse uh, to promote that kind of walkability and pedestrian safety. And you know, from my perspective, yes, uh, I have all. I remember, you know, because I'm a native, I, as uh, Mr. Uh, Councilmember McCoy is, uh, some of the very first art walks where nothing was closed off. You're literally just tons of people walking up and down the street and, and traffic just going up and down the street. And that, that felt a little sketchy, you know, as, as we've been able to close off Main Street on occasion, and obviously it made it a lot more friendly. Um, and so I think that's going to be the big challenge here is it is a state highway, and I think there's going to be certain warrants and things that CDOT will require. Uh, so to what extent can we push CDOT to allow us to restrict? I think that's a good question as well. Uh, from my point of view, yes, for a strong pedestrian friendly thriving downtown, we need to make it as unfriendly to cars mm -hmm. as possible. As I heard a business owner recently say, I've never seen a car buy a dinner or, or buy a dress from a store. I've only seen people do that. So I think that's what we kind of have to worry about as far as that's concerned. Councilor Brian. I think this is maybe for Sandy or Carol, because my memory, I mean, I distinctly, after that very high profile and unfortunate traffic death on Third Avenue, um, very distinctly as a council expressed our support for moving toward Vision Zero. I don't recollect what the, the degree of officialness that policy ended up having. So can one of you? Um, well, I think you directed us to move forward with Vision Zero, of which we're, mm -hmm. staff is working to put that together to bring that back to you. All. Sure, so that means that it will, Vision Zero is a big policy. It will inform Correct. future smaller decisions about what we do. And I think that that is, that's good enough, and that is in one way the answer. I also think, um, and, and, and this is especially important for downtown because one of the things for compliance you know with a, a, a less car centric policy is making it harder to use cars but the other side of that coin is making it easier not to and we don't want to pay to have the downtown merchants pay a penalty um, in terms of people buying dinners and dresses and stuff like that um, because it's harder to drive. So I, I, I just want to hear a discussion, I think, about what we do to achieve that balance. And in particular, what we're going to do during the construction phase for, for the hotel, which needs to become the beloved hotel. As, as a observation for that, um, you know, when you think about actually a lot of parking that is downtown, now mm -hmm. the spoke that um, people are just learning about, and Roosevelt Apartments, there's parking available, all very walkable to downtown. Um, I think the fact that um, driving is so easy to do downtown that people don't even, that's why they want to park in front of place that they are a in you know, the apparent point but also then from a pedestrian perspective because people are you know trying to get right in front where they're starting it makes Main Street and Kim Mark um, to a lesser extent uh, carry and um, Kaufman but um, the, all those very intimidating streets for pedestrians to cross and so if, if it was difficult enough that people would walk four blocks um, then it's still easy to get downtown. But then once you're downtown, it's, it's walkable. Do we actually, I would, I would make the case of the parking starting to prove whether I'm right or wrong. We have an abundance of parking. It's just everyone wants to park in the same spot and we're right in front of their store. So it's, you know, we need to create the conditions that they'll use the abundance of parking that is there. And to your point that I think the Wayne Finding Initiative should really help yeah. with that. But I, but I do think that starts with this notion of pedestrians first. And I, and I think, you know, the, my hope is that you all might consider you know, what are things that we can do to, to plan a flag and say that, yes, 
we are for pedestrians first. Um, and well, you know, I don't want this comment to take us off track, um, but I think a down payment that you can make is that there's four way stops at all intersections on Kinbark and Kaufman in the downtown area. I mean, that's a very simple, quick thing that could happen that says, yes, we, we take pedestrians more seriously than cars. Um, the idea here is, I, you know, it's, it's a philosophy that I think you guys are really, you know, hitting on here, and I think it's a, it's a good way of, uh, of uh, approaching it all. I think you have a, a well thought out plan here in general. Uh, you know, of course, we do have to focus on parking, and we do have to focus. And I hadn't thought of John's point there, putting on uh, Coffin and, and Kimbark all those stop signs. But again, that's that's an excellent uh, way of, of making it more. Pedestrian centric, and again, uh, looking at where where we want to go. If we had success with connecting the uh, the Main Street now to to one lane, you know, what's that look like? How do we get to there? Um, and at some point, because uh, if that's if that's what we're you know, our, we've got these uh, uh, these ideas that you said about making it. Uh, Where you can come and, and have dinner and, and uh, do a variety of different other activities. Okay, so then if, if that's the way we want it, then and we've seen how the, the positive effects of, of connecting it down to the one lane. Okay, let's see what, what happens with that. I did, you know, for years and years and years, we've talked about this. I mean, literally, we've talked about taking Kim Bar, we've talked about going out to the the Hobart pace, we talked about all this. And, and I think it, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think people were against it. I think there was just not enough will there. And I think that probably is the biggest uh, thing uh, that we're, we're up against. One of the things that I would just say in my observation, because you had asked about CDOT and, and just bringing that up, um, in my tenure here, recently I see CDOT bringing out grants that prioritize bikes and heads, right? And I, I don't know if that's new, it seems new to me. And so it feels like to make, even to investigate if this is the right thing, <clears throat> but to do it and to do it in conjunction with CDOT, now is probably the time because mm -hmm. it seems like they are, and, and, and who knows if if other administrations or other, other CDOT administrations will think that way, but right now it seems like they're more open to, and I know that um, from a downtown perspective, I go to those conferences and meetings as well as the creative district. Many folks are on a state highway, so it's not just us alone. So many people are dealing with that. And as CDOT reps come or other communities come, they are doing and they are experimenting or, or, or implementing these strategies that are maybe different than, than a conversation was open to previously. So it's a, I think it's a great time to really start that conversation and see if it could work with CDOT. Do you have any signs? I haven't noticed that tell where public parking is. I know in other cities, especially if I've never been there before, there will be signs that say public parking with an arrow or mm -hmm. how do people know where to park? So this year as part of that wayfinding, wayfinding. if you could go back a few slides, is that the first thing that we'll implement are what's called a parking ID sign. And so it'll be a large sign at every parking lot that says this is the name of the parking lot, it's open, and then parking trailblazers that along, so if that lot's full, there'll be a sign down the street that says parking this way, kind of pointing you to the next lot. So, okay. so those are the two first things that we'll implement to make sure that system-wide, people are understanding where those choices are. Great. Kimberly, what, how many, what are the degrees of freedom in, in terms of CDOT? And whatever those are, the degrees of freedom in terms of oh. what we can do, because I know we've been concerned, what are those and? Of all the things we've talked about from your perspective, uh, what would be the uh, maybe the highest impact? And then, you know, along with high impact, the most easily implemented, and to the degree that those might be the same thing or different, but a, a couple on a couple of different scales. Something up at high impact but high cost and hard to do that. Be interesting, interesting to know. Also, that something that's you know immediately actionable may not be as impactful, but something we could do 
right? Maybe it's four-way stops, but do you have a set of recommendations? Well, first I'll say about CDOT, I, I'm certainly no expert on CDOT. I know that they are, that what we're hearing is they're more willing to talk about strategies. And we were told, you know, if they're doing it in other communities, they'll really look at it. And their grants are trending toward how do we make things more walkable and bikeable. So I do think that that, um, I, I don't know enough about working with them on what it would be, but I, I know enough that, that they're saying, yeah, now's a great time to engage in the conversation. You know, the, I can help you on some of that. I think when we went in and we went to one lane on Main Street, if you all remember, we openly talked about this would potentially be a test case for us to look at what would the opportunity be. And so I'm teasing Phil back here. Um, I think if you said, I think honestly the one lane, in my opinion, probably has the most significant impact to, to safety and walkability. And I think it, and not to completely overshadow the uh, amount of comments that you all had to deal with when we decided to, to do that, but I think if you really looked at safety and you said what would be the, the thing to target and go after, with, because we're so close to when we tested it, is to start having conversations with CDOT in terms of how do you neck it down to where you could go one way that actually then would match potentially with the work that we're doing on Kaufman Street where we're moving the buses off of Main Street and I think the cost of that could I mean it could be a varying degree as I'm looking at Jim it could be minor adjustments into where you're just necking it down curving or something I mean we'd have to work the design to where you fully build it out and I think we could do the work but you know, Kimberly and I've talked about this a lot, and there's a lot of people that would probably string me up on my toes for saying this, but I think if you wanted to really focus on what would have the most significant impact, I think it's having that conversation and start engaging the CDOT. And I think as we look at, again, easy, safe, and home stress, um, you know, I always come back to that because... Are you talking about for us? Easy street for the council <laughs> or for, for the pedestrians. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> not not the press. There's um, no easy, safe, and low stress council jobs. Yeah, <laughs> right. But I, I, I think that um, what we see is people are avoiding the area because they don't feel it's easy, safe, or low stress, and so um, that's you know that's definitely an issue. Um, when you ask about other priorities, I think I would turn it over to my board members to chime in on you know if they have. No, it, it just feels like just listening to the conversation that there's strong alignment in regards to um, what the council is talking about versus supporting Vision Zero and the suggestion of the viability of going one lane uh, and how that aligns with our vision in, in the master plan. So, I mean, this is all positive. Um, I always need to talk more. Um, I always think too, those connections. So really talking about those connections and as we are building out and as we are planning for the future, really thinking first, how would a pedestrian get from here to there? Especially in things like in the steam area and it's first in main transit and from the greenway. Again, I can't speak enough to how important those connections to the greenway are and not having to navigate kind of to main street and you can't be on the street, you can't be wherever or, you know, it's such a gem that, that, it's, that it's a missed opportunity. So, Kimberly, thinking of the future, and hopefully not that far into the future, when we, re when we designed downtown for um, ride share, for other things, we need drop off points that are easy for people, especially people with disabilities. So, some of those side streets instead of on Main Street, if we could maybe start now moving letting the residents know this is not going to be a place where you can park we've already started it with the uh, pickup you know the food pickup mm -hmm. and and i think that that's where people have gotten used to it they can't park there so i i think that we should move in that direction slowly changing the behavior that this will be a ride share drop off point because we are going to go that way at some point, hopefully sooner than later. Um, 
you know, to, you, you make a lot of great points. To one of the points you made earlier about the cars being parked there and having it hard to see the pedestrian yeah. at the mid block, you know, the traffic engineer, when we met with him, had said maybe these are no longer parking spaces or maybe they are those drop off and pick up, mm -hmm. you know, right there at every yeah. mid block. And so I think if council wanted to look at that or if that was a change, um, maybe do both things that you have suggested in the area. It's not on the side streets, but um, it would help with it. Wherever it's yeah. feasible, I'm not yeah. an engineer, obviously. Yeah. 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 Thank God. <laughs> Marcia. Yeah. Um, Kimberly mentioned the connections, and I think that's really important. The connections are the reason that I haven't flipped in my e bike yet. Right now, I mean, okay, and the and the last two weeks of snow are another reason. Yeah. But but seriously, the connections are the year round problem for someone like me who is like a C minus to D plus biker, um, and. We've got this thing that keeps getting, you know, we zoom across it, which is we work on the pedestrian and bike adaptations when we work on that piece of the infrastructure for some other reason. And maybe we've got the tail wagging the dog a little bit. Maybe we should prioritize by the connections that are, and I understand you can't always do this, this, you know, water main breaks and breaks, right? But if you prioritize by the connections that people need for the vision, instead of the other way around and saying, well, it's been seven years since we dug up the street here, so let's dug, dig up the street here and we can put in a bike lane, maybe we would get to the answer faster. So I'd like to throw out here, does anybody else feel the same way? Do we think that the connections are the big deal? I think, in my opinion, one of the biggest problems right now is we're not enforcing what we're, what we're like the speed is a great example. Mm -hmm. People are just blowing through downtown knowing that it's 25 miles an hour and they're going who knows how fast. And so I think that would make an incredible difference short term as we're kind of working through the long term stuff uh, is to just enforce uh, the speed. Um, I think that would, you know, I rarely see a car. Uh, getting pulled over in the downtown. And it'd be nice every once in a while because we're knowing we're enforcing what we uh, what we should be enforcing. I had a resident say to me, what are you doing about the people speeding downtown? I go through there five over like a nice person and and I because I don't want them up my tailpipe and they zoom around me anyway. Well, I told him, first of all, get off Main, go on Terry or something, and second, We'll go five over, go five under. under. Yeah. You know, if you want to make a difference. So, uh, I mean, we have a big re, re education pro program. Well, same with enforcement of the dismount zone, by the way. Mm, yeah. yeah. That's a difficult. And I, unfortunately, I, I do wish a public safety representative might have been here to help yeah. us with some of these questions. And, and just one. Yeah, and I can jump in on some of them too. Yeah. Back to Tim's question on the same enforcement Carol said. I too think that it's probably the single most important thing we can do is to make uh, single lane traffic um, north and south of Main Street. But that's not a small undertaking. Uh, so uh, whatever the case may be, it's what are the down payments on change that can be made, uh, whether it's longer crosswalk signals or uh, some of the other things that we've discussed. But, um, but we also want to acknowledge that, you know, we, you know, we vote for ideas, we allocate money to make parking more affordable. But when it comes to some of these bigger things like one lane traffic, we understand you all get the calls, not us. So we appreciate you all um, taking that heat um, on the items that we've discussed. Well, this, so <clears throat> it's one thing to have a philosophy about transportation. And I, I don't think there are many degrees of freedom between, or much light between <clears throat> everything that you've shared and you know the conversations we've been in. But there's also the theory of action, right? You go big or go home, yeah. or do you do a bunch of little things, low cost, lower impact, uh, as a way to start messaging, right? yeah. and maybe modifying behavior. Um, if I take that and go back to Vision Zero, um, I'm trying to, you know, I saw, I, re I recall the five 
the priorities that Phil and Jim put up on the board. Yeah. Um, accountability, et cetera. If I were to take those, right, and put them up, and then take the things we've talked about and say, okay, let's translate those five criteria into a set of decisions, that would be an interesting exercise for me to see how that lines up. Then the question, how big do you want to go? If I'm going to get phone calls, I just soon get phone calls because we went big. I'm not probably going to get them anyway. Yeah. I think I totally agree. And I feel like, um, but if go big means seven years from now. I don't right? know, I'm not talking about seven okay. years. Okay, I was saying making those small changes are important. And I did want to go back to your point, Marsha. Um, the things that you described to me are what we were talking about preparing for the future, right? And making sure that, that when these things, or even as a catalyst to get some of the needed housing that we have or, or those kind of things is sometimes so I think we need to look at that too those connections and, and how do we do that I think you're right how do we not just wait okay this is nine years from now right so how do we look at what is what is impactful today because my fear is we do these little things here and there and they just become car centric that we build first in main transit and everyone's like yep I get in my car I get on my bus I get in my car and I go home and I'm really using it the way we well, if I recall, the five, I don't know, the principles or values, what would you what would you label the what you put up? Or what did you label at the time? This is a test here. Yeah. Yes. We're gonna fail that. All right, well, we'll just call them five five principles for the moment. As I recall, one of them is accountability. You know, one of them is you know the right set of policy decisions. I um, so in the name of accountability, if we put that up there and said, seven years we'll get there so that we're not serious about accountability let's just take that off the board right because there are some things that are going to be if, and i said it that when we sat in here if we're serious about those things there are some things that are going to have to be different for our behavior our policy decisions our resource allocation decisions are going to have to reflect that set of principles and if not let's just be quiet and not try to fool somebody that we're serious about that because we won't be right if we're serious about it let's just let's let's Lay it out and decide we're going for it. That's for me. Now I'm a short timer here, so I'm not going to get as many phone calls as these others. But but I say let's go hard. Absolutely. Harold, what did all those barriers that we had uh, out there know that they just kind of went away? I think we still have. We them. were renting. Yeah. Yeah. We have the white ones. We have those white or small water-filled ones. Those those are owned by the city, but the Larger ones that were to close off all of Main Street, each direction were okay. So I was uh, just thinking that the ones that are, are that we did have on Main Street, those are the water. Those so we put from last year. Yes. We put the um, the park woods, and then we put the water barriers in front of the park woods to to help if somebody's. But we do have the water barrier. When we when we did the um, the first time we did this, we used the. Um, or they Jersey them, barriers, Jersey barriers, which were the concrete. concrete barriers. Mm -hmm. So um, you could you could do different versions on that. I was just thinking, you know, there's there's a, a little bit of a run up, but uh, on the other hand, getting those back in place might be the the trick to, to get the the uh, to uh, Tim's point, go big or go home. We start on putting the areas out there over again to get the, the community around the idea that we're going to start doing these things and it's going to be a work in progress for these are temporary barriers and then more permanent. I think uh, if I can add something to oh. Shakita's got her hand oh. up as well. Just want oh. to let you know. Oh Shakita. Cross the arrow. There you are. Here I am. Um you all make a really good points and I agree with with all of you, I, I agree with um, Council Water, go big or go home. I definitely would love to have to see downtown one way, uh, at least if we can get the process started or uh, the research started to see what we need to do. Um, but in the meantime, I believe we definitely need to make sure that we have enough time for people to walk across the street. That is a huge issue. Um, I myself experienced that with the the um, the assistant. I think it's the assistant living. 
across from Pump House. I literally was out at the Pump House on the patio and it was raining and these senior citizens were walking across the street and the light, I mean, a lady with a walker and her friends and her friends left the lady with the walker. I ran out from the patio with my umbrella to walk this lady across the street because the light was changing. So they would have had to hit both of us because she was in the middle of the street. She was with a walker and it was raining. So of course she's gonna go slower. So I think that's an immediate change is to make sure that it's consistent up and down Main Street that people have enough time to cross the street and not be afraid. Um, two, I have been gone, when I, I drive across the, the different states all the time, and when I go into a Main Street or a downtown, of a city, a small town, there's all, most of the time there's this flashing light to tell you that the this, um, the speed is about to decrease. So is there something that we can put up that's a flashing light um, at the beginning of the street to let people know, hey, this is about, your speed is about to decrease. So you have been warned visually and you see that. Um, maybe that's something we need to start making people, I mean, we can't make anybody do anything, we know that, right? But at least being a little bit implementing those tools or those wayfindings, um, the flashing lights, maybe that's a little bit better for people. Um, and there's a, that's a warning. So, of course, we don't know what all is being enforced downtown um, from a police uh, standpoint, how many are out there you know, giving warnings or uh, violations. I'm not sure, we don't know that. But um, I'm all for the one lane and definitely those little pieces of just making sure that people have enough time to cross the street. Um, people with wheelchairs are have enough time to cross the, cross the street. And a visible sign or lights that flash when the, when the, the uh, speed limit changes. So that's what I have a question for Harold. Um, as you mentioned earlier, that we, that we wouldn't be starting from scratch with um, going big, going bold, one lane, some of the four feet. Maybe. Potentially. Potentially, yeah. So can you um, help us understand where, what are the steps moving forward that we're seeing? Well, one of the things I was going to say here, I think um, understanding the, the framework that we're working on is, is going to be pretty important. Um, so when we look at, one of the things I was gonna tell council, and I've, I've got meetings coming up to, to figure out both of these issues. Um, when we look at what's in play, two of the anchor projects that we're talking about that gets to this is actually first the main transit station and the Kaufman Street project, of which both of those are coming in once again projected um, we're going to need money for both of those and um, I think generally right now I'm looking at the back first of Maine we could need an additional million dollars Kaufman Street not, or the transit station right we're looking at an additional potential million dollars Kaufman Street can be upwards of four to five million based on what we're seeing I'm seeing David going even more than that so when we look at those those anchor projects into the point of what's our accountability, if those are the two core projects, then I think you know we're going to have to really focus funding on those two core projects to really set the stage for other things, and that's probably that's going to entail us relooking at everything within our transportation budget, um, and if you know if that's what we want to see done. It is highly likely that we come back in and say we're going to have to cut this amount of money off of rehab or some other section of the transportation fund in order to see this project through um, because of those cost demands. So I wanted everybody to understand that. So as we're talking about under this, know that there is a pretty big bogey out there for us financially that we're already seeing on projects that were substantially down the road on what we're what they are and i'm tangentially involved in the conversations is um we're partnering with nbc which is the national development council and they're looking at other funding sources and kimberly and i were talking about this is 
how do we aggregate these and work with him to try to bring in additional funding sources so we can look at the aggregate of what we're trying to do and fill some of these gaps because uh, there's definitely going to be financial pressures on, on all of these projects. Um, and I haven't thrown out another project that I think is incredibly important to this that we haven't seen is uh, the work that Jim and his group is doing in terms of the Boston Street crossing on the railroad because that's going to pull traffic off the third. And so there's cost parameters there. You know, we're dealing with the quiet zones. And, and so, Jim? Boston Avenue Bridge. And, and Boston yeah. Avenue Bridge is part of Brazilian yeah. St. Grain. So there are all of these pressures financially that we have. And I think to the point is, you know, we know we have two projects there that are foundational to everything we're talking about, but we're gonna have to be reviewing these in council from a funding perspective to really figure out where we go and or look at how do we get increased funding for it. Of, of which, and Kimberly can talk about the NDC work because it's how do we bring what we're talking about into it, but how do we look at a more holistic approach to parking in the entire area? So Kimberly, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I think as we were working with NDC, we, we kind of put on a map all of the things that are in the pipeline right now and looked at what's on the pipeline and what are those missing connections and what would we need. And NDC said, as opposed to looking at, there's a parking project here and there's another project here and another project here, maybe you look at it as one huge kind of city center project. So how do we look at those, put them together, and see what kind of, um, you know, if we wanted to do a bond, or if we, are, is there other funding sources out there? How can you look at it more holistically as opposed to a one-off here and a one-off there, and then you build kind of connections to build on it? So I think that's the work that we would like to look at further. I did want to say some of our next steps is we're five years into our master plan. And so I, our board retreat in February, we're really going to say, where have we been and what have we accomplished and what are the next steps? Part of that was this conversation, having this conversation and finding out your philosophy and, and understanding a little bit more of what council's thinking. Now, if we talk about traffic calming or a one lane main street, we will go back to stakeholders. We just want to really point out that this was the first part of that conversation and it didn't really work for us to go out and rally the troops if we didn't meet city council's philosophies, right? So now we'll be having, starting those stakeholder conversations and engagement. So I just wanna make sure that folks know that yes, we will be going out and having those conversations, looking at our master plan, um, and then looking at funding for, for these and other critical needs that address parking, that address um, other things, looking holistically at what we need to get to this vision of easy, safe parking. So I did wanna make that crystal Wanted to make sure that the philosophy was on the project. Yeah, I, I did not get to weigh in a lot for the first part. And, uh, you know, I, I am in alignment with uh, what I've heard from my council colleagues as well as what you all are, are talking about um, in regard to pedestrian first. Ideally, so, you know, we made, my husband and I made that decision years ago. We parked at second, and now that parking lot is full. Cool. We used to never be. But we can just park on one end and just kind of work our way and you know focusing on that looking at shops that are in downtown you know there are clothing stores that i've not noticed before and a lot of people have said especially when businesses are going under you know oh i didn't know that that was there well no you didn't because you're driving up <laughs> so i i am very much in favor of that idea of going down to one lane um, I have a commute. I live on the north side of town, having to commute to the south side to go to work. Um, I survive. You know, we will live. Uh, you know, it's, it's not as, as convenient. But the other the other thing that was very is very dangerous with the people we have people passing each other on on Main Street. So that's you know, and I understand that it is a highway. It's 87. Um, but if C dot is um, available. Of allowing us to do it for that section, I, I would be in support of that. Um, other things that I would like to see done immediately would be those traffic lights crossing the street. Um, I, yeah, I'm with Zora and my old age. <laughs> Talk to me about that. <laughs> it's yeah. taken me for, especially post COVID, it takes me forever. And 
I never make it on time, even when I do. Um, Cecile Walker, you swear to not change it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, mm -hmm. last week I was walking away from it. So, yeah. um, it, it changes fast. So, and the other one would be looking at where those cross, uh, midway crossing, uh, mid block crossing, to, to look at eliminating a lot of those barriers, whether it be car or tree. Um, that is something that could be done pretty, pretty fast. And it's one of the things we talk, we do have one of those flashing lights um, on um, ninth, ninth. Mm -hmm. and, and that can be an interesting experience too, mm -hmm. because sometimes people don't pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. And I've seen so many, because that's on my way home. Mm -hmm. And those just aren't completely safe because I've seen a number of near misses even with those lights. And so I think you do need to clear side lines. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because the sidelines are going to be incredibly important with mm -hmm. even, even things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, most of our community believes that those, that those crosswalks with the flashing lights are the answer. So I, if they're not, we, we need to do a better job of messaging why not. Because the, the, only, the, the only conversation I recall, there was a time early on when Tyler was still with us and we talked about that and, and I, what resonates or what I think I recall is that somehow there was data uh, that somebody had to indicate that those were not as safe as we thought or as some, most people assume. If that's the case, it would be good to get us that information. Because I, I have to tell you, I got phone calls today and emails knowing that this meeting was going to occur with expectations that people have for us doing something. I think and putting, one of the things we keep hearing is that, is give us those crosswalks. Yeah. You're all putting those. Yeah, Kyle Hayworth is a new um, traffic engineer for the city. Uh, and he is, he's, he said something really clear that I didn't pick up on earlier, but he, it was a good take for this. He mentioned it's the intention to walk. So when you push the button, you're, you're telling the traffic that you intend to cross that street. And so that's, that helps everybody involved. It's a communication. Yeah, the, 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 I think where I've seen it, where the danger really comes, I think Boulder may have had this, is when somebody hits it, and as soon as it starts flashing, they just go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even at crosswalks, you know, I think where we have probably as many car ped accidents as anywhere is the crosswalk between uh, safety and justice and, mm -hmm. and City Hall, I mean, of which a lot of people from SMJ, you know, even there when that clock starts, I think we've all trained ourselves to really look at the people that are driving and turning. Um, we just don't go. And I think that's part of the education piece is to say, just because it starts flashing doesn't mean you go. Yeah, but that's still upside down. The burden of not hitting pedestrians is on the automobile. Oh, I agree. I just... Yeah. <laughs> I, I just think that's part of it. So. I think in terms of direction, you know, one of the things we were we were talking about is, um, I think if if council is interested in approaching the, the one lane concept, I do. Kimberly talked about a, a public involvement process and really overtly engaging in that because I think that's going to be necessary, and we can look at some of those other options. I think in the meantime, <coughs> looking at those signs to to put in the mid block crossings, correct. We're working on that with CDOT. So that, and again, CDOT's the one that has to say yes to all of this. Yeah, I did want to just clarify. I did not want to ever give the intention that CDOT said yes, that was a yes. I know that in these things, they're saying we're more yeah. open to yeah. hearing about concepts and talking about it. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be crystal clear that. For the Fifth Avenue, the, fifth, the, mid, the mid block. And the, the six, we have, we have put in the data for them and they've said go ahead and put it there. And we're working on the other two crossings get that next step going. Should I correct the tweet that I just sent out for you? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> do not get a tweet. Um, and, and I do think that's important is this is a state highway. Mm -hmm. It's unlike many other places. And so at the end of the day, CDOT is going to make the decision as to all of these things. And I think based on your direction, if that's where it is, I think we start conversations and work collectively with CDOT versus surprising them or shocking them. Well, this is a, a nuanced thing 
But if you're negotiating with CDOT and they've got all these rules that we don't see until they wave them under our nose sometimes. Um, narrow lanes are also traffic common, I believe. And so I wouldn't want to have real absolute <coughs> direction because it may be that they can't take us to one lane, but they could take, they could allow us to make our two lanes in each direction skinnier and put bike and pedestrian safety rules and, and necks and stuff like that, that would have much the same effect. So can we be, you know, broad-minded about this? I mean, I'm severing a no back there and I was just making, you know, making well, sure Well, I was just saying, I was just saying that Harold meant signaling that well, our lanes on Main Street are already three feet narrower than the standard C dot twelve foot lane. So we run eight we run eight and we run eight to nine foot lane. Yeah. Yeah. So we're doing that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and not on the two hundred block. Which yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just the, the one thing is I also just want to encourage you to, to you know keep in mind it's not just Main Street. Yeah. I mean yeah. Kim Bark with you know the Civic Center here yeah. and the Seals and some of those and the, and the parking lot uh, to Pump has the busiest uh, parking lot in town. Kimbark is uh, equally uh, kind of treacherous right now as Main Street. Uh, this is not all of those. I have to turn around. Okay, thank you. Um, so I noticed on Kaufman, when we we'll go on Kaufman, there are either the lights or four way stops. Lights, but then on Kimbark, there are where it's just stop, you stop on the two going east and west, but if you're on Kimbark, and that is that I try to cross it again, slow walker. So, and so that if that is something that we can look at doing four way uh, stops in some of those areas, especially where there are restaurants in those areas, so there's a lot of cross traffic. Um, so, okay. I just want to reiterate that we really think of downtown as an extension of everyone's neighborhood and we don't want this to be we want everyone to come here and feel welcome from every neighborhood in Longmont. These changes are, are, are going to be helpful for every resident, every visitor. So we really just want to reiterate that we feel like downtown is an extension of everyone's neighborhood. We want everyone to come and feel comfortable and so that's why we're here. I do want to bring something to your attention. During COVID, uh, of course, that is why uh, restaurants extended their restaurant hours. Mm -hmm. And um, the municipalities, the highway departments were agreeable to that. Mm -hmm. But now in some states, the, the municipalities, the, the restaurants want to keep that space because it's lucrative and it's like you said. But they are now, it's now, um, very valuable property to the city, to CDOT, to, to they may want to rent that to you because it's property that they are losing, but that they can rent to you. And I've seen that in, in some states and some, just FYI, if we make it into a permanent, that's their real estate. So one thing to add to that, 287 is a federal highway. Yeah, well. There are requirements. We ran into it when we were, were doing the parklets and things. Now, about, I believe it was Phil brought it up that uh, Federal Highway had to have, does have issues with private businesses using that public right of way for their benefit. Right. Um, one thing I will add, just so everybody is aware of it, there's about 25,000 vehicles a day running up and down. So if we add more time to the crossings, and I understand the group consensus is that, the council's consensus is that, and we want to make it safer, if we can do that, it will cause more congestion on Main Street. It will, there will be offshoots that people will go elsewhere. Right. And, and narrowing those roads down, we can certainly start talking to CDOT and start looking at groundwork now. That's not an issue. We'll look at the timings, and we'll look at the crossings on Kimbark as well to see if we can do anything about about on some of the crossings about looking at the four-way stops if they meet our criteria. But this is is Kimberly made note that she doesn't want to wait seven years. This might be a seven-year project between getting fund, it funded and getting it approved and getting it permitted. 
and it will be expensive. Just wanted, changes just wanted to make instead of waiting there. seven years, not <laughs> you know. Yes. But we will, we will, we will be looking at. We can certainly look at those things um, in the coming weeks. So I think so. I'm clear with the council is start exploring the idea of one lane. Um, that's probably the biggest one for us. We're already looking at and working with CDOT on the mid-block crossing signs. The council wanted us to look at sight lines as it relates to trees and cars parking in, in those areas, which may mean these parking spots um, as we're looking at sight lines. Um, and then we did talk about looking at a more holistic approach and working with NDC in terms of parking generally in the area um, as part of that project, understanding that we have two key projects that are going to have funding constraints um, as we see them today. So looking at it in with NDC and this broader concept of parking. But we're not still concerned about enforcement. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so to give you a sense in enforcement, um, it's interesting. I got these numbers for a different reason. So I think last year we had about 157,000 calls into um, 911. Um, of that 157,000 calls, 95,000 were calls that we actually dispatched police to. Um, and to give you a sense, that's about 260 calls per day, 10 calls per hour, and then the nature of those calls depend on how we, we dispatch officers. Um, and as you are, as council knows, probably more than anything, um, we went to a take home car program this year because of recruiting and hiring police officers. And so we've been riding this wave uh, of staffing just based on where we are right now. Um, I did send Jack a note to talk to me about it. Um, our traffic control division is is one that um, can get eaten up pretty fast. So if we have um, accidents with serious bodily injuries or fatalities, which we've had a fair amount on 66 and 119, as they're investigating that and processing, we can lose our traffic control group pretty fast when we have things like that occur. And it's just compounded by the staffing issue. So I will talk to Zach about enforcement. I know I've seen him a few times because um, he's made me check my speed. I've seen him by uh, Lost Peak in some other areas. Uh, but, you know, when we look at that, we're also managing capacity or call volume for the entire community as well. And depending on the nature of calls, we could lose three officers immediately. You know, if you know, domestic violence calls automatically get two officer response. So, if you look at what we have on the street and you get two DVs, we've lost four officers in, in the blink of an eye. And then depending on the time, but yeah, I'll talk to Zach and then we'll get more information on that. Carol, one last thing. We'll add it to the grant list. Sure. Let's start looking at the CDOT's coming out with the highway safety grant. That one of the criteria is to reduce gas rain incident. This may be a little longer. So we'll I still think we should just have those pop up tire shredders. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody goes up to the speed Oh, I know that. That's better than shooting your tires. So, in terms of my overview, did I miss? I don't want to miss council's direction. Is there anything that I said in that overview that council disagrees with? Faster, faster, faster. I don't see. Seeing hands coming up. So, do you have what you need? Yeah. Thanks, Rick. We need, we need a, a party group. Yeah. 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 So, um, we have a motion to make sure this presentation. Oh, second. All those in favor, please stand. Pollard's and Yeah, I just let some of the 